It's one out, one in from now on, so if you go out to the toilet, you're not getting back in. Uh, really disappointed we're not in the big room. Andy and I, both keen snooker fans, we were hoping to be in the room where the greatest ever line in television was uttered, which was, for those of you watching in black and white, the green is behind the blue. <laughs> um, so this is the panel for people who've read about Netflix and wonder if there's anything in it for them if they're not called Simon Chin. But actually, online is a tremendously exciting world where authenticity trumps big market, or does it? So we've got a structure, we've got a fantastic panel. We kind of have a sense of where we think we're going to go, but my number is up there. And if you think you're missing the point, I've got a really good question, text it to me. And if I think it's a good question, I'll ask it. So uh, panel crew can answer almost any question you have about factual. So we have Jamie Balment from BBC Documentaries. Hamish Mykura from practically every other panel that's already happened so far. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and will be, eh? So Hamish has lost his voice. Uh, Faraz from um, uh, Lemonade Money, uh, Brian Woods. And Andy, we're going to kick off with you, Andy, from Little Dot. <laughs> this is actually just an advertorial. Andy has actually paid for this whole thing. The rest of us are just like window <laughs> dressing. It's an advertorial for him to launch his new strand. So take it away. Tell us, who are the online audience? So um, let me give you a bit of uh, a background because um, we're going to talk, I think, a lot about Real Stories, which is our documentaries channel uh, on YouTube. But uh, background of Little Dot Studios is we, um, we're four years old and we, we essentially run YouTube channels for all the major broadcasters in the UK and uh, for about 100 indies in the UK. So if you've watched, uh, if you've been to a YouTube channel that's around a British TV programme, we're probably behind it. Um, and we're also quite large in the States as well. And so our journey to real stories is that we started to um, have lots of data around what TV content people were watching on YouTube. So we do about two and a half billion views a month um, to TV clips uh, on YouTube. And uh, two things were interesting to us. The first is that despite YouTube predominantly talking around, talking about YouTube creators like PewDiePie or Zoella or this kind of whole new kind of uh, group of vloggers, actually TV content on YouTube is kind of dwarfs any of that. So uh, I quite like um, giving examples like the This Morning YouTube channel is about twice as big as Zoella. Like ITV feel like they're a real Luddite, slow-moving broadcaster, but actually they have a YouTube channel that's twice as big as Zoella. So TV on YouTube is is really, really big. And we then started to dig deeper into the data and we saw some quite interesting things. So the biggest uh, genre that we see on YouTube is preschool kids, but the second biggest genre, uh, which we thought was quite surprising, is factual and documentaries. So it's bigger than, you know, we look after the Graham Norton show, Alan Carr Chatty Man, we do lots of entertainment shows, but uh, younger people are watching documentaries. It's the second biggest genre for us in that two and a half um, uh, billion views uh, uh, that, that we get each month. So uh, that's why we wanted to have this discussion because um, having attended factual conferences in the past, there was quite a bit of pessimism around factual and maybe the time has passed and people aren't, aren't watching it, but actually the opposite is true. People are watching, the data tells us, more factual and more documentaries than they've ever watched before. They're just watching it in different ways, and they're definitely watching it on demand on platforms uh, like YouTube. OK, Brian, you're going to tell us about an unexpected success. Please go ahead. Uh, it depends whether you're, you expect it or not, whether it's unexpected. So Unexpected by me. <laughs> so um, we made a film uh, recently with Stacey Dooley. So we're, uh, our experience... My company, True Vision, are, we make social issue documentaries, usually quite heavy, serious ones, mostly for BBC One, BBC Two and Channel Four, but then we've increasingly been doing stuff for BBC Three as well. Um, and we've been working with Stacey Dooley. And uh, the Stacey films are phenomenally successful on, uh, on BBC Three. So the film we've just done, that we're about to show you a clip of, um, called Stacey Dooley Investigates, a long title, Stacey Dooley Investigates Mums Selling Their Kids for Sex, is the third highest rating uh, documentary on the BBC Three, I think, no, show on BBC Three this year, 
the highest, the, the second highest is, is another Stacey Dooley film about um, Japan. So she's very, very popular among the BBC Three audience. Uh, what I found extraordinary, though, was then when the marketing people at BBC Three started sort of c cutting bits down and packaging them up and putting them on Facebook, um, that one of those clips got 18 million views, which I was quite impressed by. I thought that was quite astonishing. Um, should we have a look at that clip? Okay, powerful stuff there, Brian. Um, I'm going to ask Hamish to talk a little bit about what uh, online means for Net Geo. Well, um, it means various things. I mean, the, we, we generate a lot of content across um, the whole piece from National Geographic, whether it be explorers in the field generating content, whether it be photographers for the magazine who are also shooting video, a lot of that makes its way online. We make content especially for online, but I think what's been very interesting this year on National Geographic has been taking some of, some of our really premium, expensive documentaries and releasing them very widely online in conjunction with the TV broadcast, which kind of is contrary to the model that TV channels would normally use, where you would try and make sure that people had to come to your channel to watch your big shows. So a good example of that was Before the Flood. Before the Flood is Leonardo DiCaprio's climate change documentary directed by Fisher Stevens. Uh, DiCaprio has been working on this for, for really a number of years. Uh, we were really pleased to be a partner on that film. And because it's really part of the kind of campaigning uh, element of National Geographic. You know, we sort of sometimes talk about the channel moving from, you might say, from reverence to relevance. You know, it's sort of from being something which just presented the Did you the just world. make that up? I made it up in conjunction with our marketing department. Oh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, yeah, so that, that, kind of, uh, that kind of transition is interesting. And, uh, and so you're sort of trying to make make this film not just something that people will watch on that geo, you're trying to make it a proper talking point. And so we rolled it out not just on, uh, um, on that geo TV, which is accessible online, but it was also on Amazon, it was on Hulu, it was on Facebook, it was on a whole range of different platforms for 10 days during and following the broadcast. And the result of that was really interesting. I mean, the number of people who watched that program was way in excess of, of, of the figures that we would normally get for an Geo documentary or in a way for, for any documentary. Um, it was, uh, there were 60 million, uh, 60 million uh, uh, viewings of it and if you total all the minutes viewed, you get over one minute, one billion minutes viewed, which is a kind of record break. So is, is, this, is this the moment we've all been waiting for? Only 50 years after the internet was invented, finally TV commissioners realised that the overnight doesn't matter. John, I must say, I had a moment in our political history where a bunch of red-faced Ulstermen are coming over and dictating to us what we can do. I think you're really in the zeitgeist with, uh, with that question. <laughs> Anyone that hasn't seen the DUP's Wikipedia, which was hacked, go and have a look at it. It's very funny. <laughs> anyway, sorry, that's, uh, that's... Yeah, back to your point. What was your point? My point was, does this mean that you're going to stop looking at overnights as the arbiter of success now that you've finally woken up to something which was called the long tail about 10 years ago? <laughs> well, look, I mean, I, I think that the, the, uh, the overnights have been really diminishing in relevance for international broadcasters for a long time. They're a lot less relevant if you're an international broadcaster than they are if you're a local broadcaster, partly because they're quite difficult to get. Yeah. Some countries don't even have overnights. Right. So in a way, you're much more interested in, me in measures of reach and measures of impact than in straightforward measures of how many people watch you on telly. Um, and, and how far you're getting online is really important because you're reaching clearly a younger audience, a different audience. So I'll just show a little clip of uh, Before the, the Flood. Yeah, Before, Before the, the Flood clip, please. So, Jamie, uh, we were just talking about how you measure success. How does BBC Documentaries measure success in this area? Are we talking principally about BBC Three here, yeah. I think? Um, I think there's several ways of measuring success, but I think reach, obviously reach in this kind of conversation is, is, is hugely important. And picking up from something that Brian was saying, um, the, the way that BBC Three is using, we use both... Um, God. Sounds like a guitar back back in track, but we're um, I guess we're, we're working in long form. We work quite closely with the um, with the, the BBC Three social team, and what they're doing is is they're often repurposing our our long form content, which people would watch um, either on linear television or on iPlayer. And what we're doing is we're not we're, we're kind of we're creating films that almost would feel that they they're sort of commissioned in their own right. I think what we're trying not to do, and what sort of in the past and learning from sort of mistakes, is that people online. Particularly, young audience don't want—they don't want trails, they don't want promotions, they want proper stories. 
They want things that kind of have a beginning, middle, and end, and have a sort of narrative sense in their own right. If you look at something like um, the, Rio, the Rio Ferdinand doc on, on bereavement on BBC One recently, both BBC Three and, 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 and BBC News um, cut their own packages, films from, from that long form. Um, and the overall reach across various different BBC social networks was 28 million. And some of those wouldn't, wouldn't the, the aim of that was not to drive the audience back to, to, to BBC One, although 30% of people who watched it did go back to BBC One. I think it's about getting to, a, to a, an entirely new audience that won't come to BBC One, that won't come to iPlayer. Um, I think there's a, it's not a sense of when we sort of created the BBC Three website was sort of build it and they will come. You need to get your content in front of that audience on whatever platform they're watching at. So you're now completely platform agnostic, you don't care? Don't care. No, I really don't care. I think it's, it's really important. I think that's, I think that's, hopefully, that, that, so if anyone else doesn't agree with that, but I think that's what is really important to do that. How long is a documentary on BBC Three? So, a documentary can be anything from kind of amazing humans, could be two minutes, um, all the way up to um, Daddy's Weekend America, which is playing at the festival, which I think is 180 minutes. Right, so, so it literally is cut it to what it makes. It's, you need to be, I think it's, what's really refreshing with, with, um, with online is that you, you cut it to the strength of the material. Um, you really, really should, and I think there's, there's examples I'll talk about later where stories that wouldn't have fitted into traditional long form have actually been given a whole new life that five, ten years ago without online platforms just wouldn't have seen the light of day, and they're brilliant stories. I think it's telling the story mm. in the best possible way. So, than... so two great pieces of news, I think. First, we have a, a broadcaster saying that the overnights don't matter too much, and secondly, going back to cut it to what it makes, which is what we used to say in news, and it actually is really important. As you started, I think, in Channel, you worked in Channel 4, and you left Channel 4. Tell us a little bit about how you measure success for your projects. Uh, well, we're a small business, and so we measure success by surviving from day to day, and I think that that's kind of the, um, the key to, to, to a lot of this. It's, you know, an indie is, is two things. It's a creative company, and you need to make sure that the ideas you have are as good as they can be and you're making stuff that you want to make and you feel proud of creatively but but also you have this additional pressure of, of running a business and ensuring that you can continue to turn over so you can keep your staff paid and and clothed and fed and I think that the um, those are two challenges that we have day in day out and and where, where we have moved the business is um, you know we started as a TV company it started before I joined um, and it was before the online explosion and, and we were a traditional TV indie. Um, uh, today, uh, the vast majority of our, our income and our customers are what we would call online partners. Um, and, you know, the success metrics are... The thing, the thing about success metrics in, in this industry, and once you move that TV and, and what has been very much defined as overnights and, and viewing figures, it has now moved in very much into more of marketing speak around KPIs. And, you know, I could tell you a lot of things. You know, we have had... 2 billion plus hits on YouTube and it's like well that sounds amazing that's an impressive figure and I'm sure the, a lot of these guys have seen decks that have had like these big massive figures we've got this many subscribers mm -hmm. and our attention rate is this but actually a, a lot of it is smoke and mirrors unfortunately and who's the smoke and mirrors aimed at we're going to get down to the money now which is why I know you're all here <clears throat> well it's I mean it's it's aimed at it's aimed at two things one is is we've spoken to a, a lot of brands who want to get eyeballs on, on the content that they're making, obviously, otherwise, why, you pay, pay, why have you paid for it? And I think that there's been a, a tradition in, in media for quite a long time around advertising, and when it comes to overnights, of effectively guesswork. And, and I think that a lot of people here, would pro I would argue, would probably agree that, that overnight ratings are a little bit of this. And when online has exploded, it has, it has resulted in much more defined metrics around how long you're watching something for, where your attention is, what the figures are, what the demographics of that person is. And it's scared advertisers quite a lot into making sure that everything is hyper-targeted because they're, they're the ones spending the money. They're the ones putting their hands in their pocket, paying, apart from obviously the BBC and, and what those guys are doing, but more, by and large, they're the ones that are spending money on that content. And that has created an entirely new dynamic, which is then further exacerbated by click farms and, and people where, if anybody runs a Facebook page or, a, or a, um, a, uh, uh, has put a Facebook video on, uh, on their Facebook page, you'll see a little button that says, hey, if you give us $10, you can reach 5,000 people. And if you give us $20, you can reach 100,000 people. And you start kind of going, well, this is a pay-to-play thing, and how comfortable do I feel about that? And you're in this constant battle about producing the best possible thing with the resources that you have, or producing something that's a little bit 
Can I use the word shitty? I don't know if I'm allowed to use Shitty it. advertorial. Shitty, yeah. I'm not shitty advertorial, which brings us back, of course, <laughs> to Andy. So, t- Andy, tell us more about... Uh, no, I actually would like to know. Explain the financial mechanism of real screen. Real story. Real story, sorry. So, um, or should, we, should we play a, the real story trust so people know what it is, and then I can explain a bit maybe about where the money comes from. So, so the idea, so we'd seen the data and we could see that documentaries were being watched. Um, so we then went out to talk to our kind of clients and it's quite interesting because we were finding that documentaries that had been made more than two years ago really weren't the focus of the sales teams and the distribution companies. They were selling scripted shows, that was where the money was. So we just found there were hundreds of hours of amazing documentaries sitting on shelves that just weren't available to view. So that was why we decided to, to, to launch Real Stories. And I think, I'll come to the money, but we then started talking to clients and partners and production companies, and actually it wasn't the money that led it, it was the fact that they wanted the chance to have their documentaries available and seen again and again. A lot had, had one TX. Um, so we've now got, I think we've got about 2,000 documentaries under license, 300 of them are available on Real Stories, and we upload three or four um, a week. And really the money is, the more views we get, the more advertising gets served, um, and the more money we make. What's the split? What's the split? So we share revenue 50-50 with the the production company, and we'll share out about a million pounds this year. So it's, to us, big in the industry terms. I know that's quite small, but um, the channel is growing. And in terms of young documentary makers out there who might want to pitch Real Stories, how do they do that? So uh, today, everything on Real Stories is a, is a, a full-length documentary that has been on Channel 4, the BBC, PBS. Uh, I guess the, um, uh, we're keen to add uh, documentaries that haven't even been on TV. So what's fascinating about events like this for me is you, you hear about all of the documentaries being made that aren't necessarily broadcast on TV, well, we've got a home here, we can, we can get views. We've got documentaries with 9 million views on the channel. Um, and then what we'd like to do now is experimenting in a quite small way with commissioning Real Stories originals. So for us, that would be a, um, something that's about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, we are predominantly on YouTube, and YouTube is not a place for two-minute videos. It's a place for longer 10, 15, 20-minute stories. Um, so we will commission this year about eight to ten uh, original documentaries for the, for the channel. Okay. Jamie, what opportunities are there for these people to pitch for your business? So there is, I predominantly, um, I, I work in, in long form commissioning across BBC One, Two and Three, but particularly for sort of BBC Three, there is, there, we do, I think 70% of all, uh, the entire budget of BBC Three is on long form, and about 40% of that is in factual, and that factual is then split down into documentaries and current, current affairs. And the, I think the budgets are, are, are really healthy. I think we make a, a broad range of, of documentaries. We, sort of current needs, I think we have a lot of American content on the channel at the moment. I'd say I look at um, domestic stories, domestic series, um, and domestic single films. So I think there's, we also are looking for new voices from, from behind the camera and also we have a great roster of, of talent on the channel, um, but we're all looking, always looking for kind of new presenters with that as well. Hamish, there's no real opportunity, is there? Well, <laughs> well, we've got uh, um, commissioned content for online only. Uh, there's a good example of that actually would be uh, um, Wildlife, which is a, a series fronted by a young uh, former BBC wildlife cameraman called Bertie Gregory, and uh, he, he basically went, wanted he he loves black bears, he loves a lot of animals, but he particularly is into black bears. So he went on a journey up the uh, Pacific coast of Canada, and he's very good at rigging particular sites with very small cameras. That's his kind of favourite thing, and and filmed all these kind of bear behaviours, which were really quite unusual and and often hadn't been seen in that way before. But he's just a very engaging person and does the kind of 
in some ways, the best way to envisage it, it's like the, uh, uh, the, the ten minute section at the end of Planet Earth 2 where you actually see how the cameraman mm. did it. And it's got that same kind of vibe to it. But he's a very engaging person. You're interested in his story, you're interested in his adventures. In some of those little webisodes, nothing happens. And then in other ones, amazing things happen. Uh, in fact, I think I've got a little clip of Bertie Gregory I can show you, which is definitely worth taking a look at. Please I don't do. know if it's possible to roll that. But just to be clear, you don't have a huge pot of money to commission a lot of those. Well, there are more now than there were, and we're increasingly uh, commissioning some of those similar types of programmes of different people, particularly, they, they work particularly well with presenters and with uh, people who are doing that kind of first-person narrative about what they're doing. It's a lot more like online content. That's more it like a blog, more. isn't it? <clears throat> for sure. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. And who do you pitch for that? Uh, well, you can pitch anything to us. We can always find the right person to take it to in the US. I myself don't commission very much for National Geographic Wild, which means natural history content overall. But I'm very connected with the people in the US who do and the people in the online team who do. So uh, uh, I can always send it on to the right person. Okay. Faris, I'd like to talk about your model is music videos I think you make most of your money from. Uh, well, no, actually. like Music videos, we make videos about music, okay. which is subtly different. Um, the, the, the industry around music videos is, is very, very mature and it's, it's quite a different world. And we do make music videos, but the majority of our business is making videos about music. Okay. That makes sense? Yep. But talk about AFP, which is the other big strand. Yeah, so we have done some ad-funded programmes and um, I, I think the reason that that's been an attraction for us is, is speed more than anything else. Um, and, you know, we've been to a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of panels, you know, great sessions here and, and it's... it's um, there's been a lot of amazing ideas that have been born out of that, but, but what we find as a small company when it comes down to speed is that what AFP allows us to do is brands generally have a tighter brief and a very clear timeline when they need to make that happen. So as, as a business, we can model our business around that because we know if we get this, we can spin it up and we can make it work and deliver it at a certain time. And when it comes to stuff that Hamish is doing and Jamie's doing, you know, a lot of the time as a small company, you have to spend a lot of time developing ideas and getting the access and doing all that. And a lot of that is on you as a company and there's a lot of pressure around there. So what AFP has allowed us to do is we've, it's, it's basically a cash flow system. Um, if we get the idea away, we know within a couple of weeks that it's happening. We can spin up production. We know when it's going to get delivered. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And we can go on from then. There's loads of chats in TV about the long no. Um, that doesn't happen in AFP. If, if a brand doesn't want to do something, they'll tell you they don't want to do it. So how do you get into the tendering process in the first place? Um, well, there are lots of people that... that it's, it's changing on a pretty much day-to-day -day basis. Um, Channel 4 have started dipping their toe into doing stuff on, on shorts. Um, we've seen tenders come to us directly from brands, um, and we do a lot of stuff direct to brands. Um, more, and more, more and more brands are seeing the power of video and, and uh, hiring video commissioners. Um, we've had stuff come to us from media agencies, including Mediacom and, and you know, all, all the major media agencies along, along the way. Um, we've had PR companies come to us with briefs. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that we've made it work is we've treated ourselves as a production company like a brand. Um, and you know, if you'll see that from, I think we might be showing our show in a bit, but you'll see that from our well, show. Well, let's, let's have a look at it now. So yeah, very nicely done. So it's about selling yourselves as a brand and then they come to you. Yeah, we've, we've had a series on Channel 4 for four seasons now with, with um, Four to the Floor, which has been our award-winning music show. Um, and uh, we're, I mean, we're really proud of that, but, but it's, not a, it's not a revenue model for us. It's, you know, it's not the sort of thing that we're gonna um, put on the bottom line and, and our, our finance guys, look at it with a raised eyebrow every time we do it. But, but again, it's about building a brand and people see that and we are then able to kind of you put that on our show reel and show what our style and our, our approach is. Um, and both brands and, and commissioners in general kind of see that and go, we want a slice of that. And, mm. and that's helped us grow as a business in, in, as a result. Okay. Brian, how much money have you made out of all of this? <sighs> Not a lot. Um, I mean, so the stuff we do for BBC Three, that's that's... You know, properly funded, it's the same as BBC One, BBC Two uh, um, budgets. So, you know, we've made, I don't know, probably half a dozen, uh, six or eight films for probably maybe ten films for BBC Three. So, you know, that's that's a significant revenue stream. Then, um, then the stuff. So, um, I don't know whether you put it on specially for yeah, me. You had a few in there, didn't you? Chosen <laughs> was yeah. yeah. Chosen was a film I made. Um, what, ten years or so ago, uh, and and when Little Dot came and said we'd like to put it on 
on, on the channel, I was, yeah, great, fantastic. I'd love people to see it. But then checks started arriving, which was nice. You know, not huge checks, but you know, <laughs> checks we wouldn't have had otherwise. And people were seeing the film, which was, which was great. So, mm. uh, yeah, it's not, uh, I'm not going to give up making TV for the, the channels, yeah. that's for sure. But can, I, can I just say, Please if, don't. if you want to make money, make shit up. It's as simple as that. I mean, if you look at, like, you talked earlier about, about how um, the online video world is a lot of it in fact in a documentary. If you start typing in Illuminati or uh, Infowars.com, you know, you'll see massive amount of, of subscriber hits on that and view counts on that. YouTube and Google put adverts in front of stuff and it's all about eyeballs. And, and a lot of stuff is, is the Katie Hopkins, Piers Morgan branch of, of stuff, which is get some attention make shit up, and then put some advertising in front of it. I don't think that anybody's, I mean, obviously surprised that anyone who's come to this conference is coming at it from a, I want to be a multi-millionaire by, by gaming, YouTube, or Facebook. But if you do, then, then that's the way to do it. Be as sensationalist as possible and, and shout about it. And, and unfortunately, the way that that system is set up, because there is very little regulation on the, on, in the internet, for, for good reason, I would argue, it, it does mean that actually um, you, can, you can start talk radio stations and spew nonsense and why are you dragging us it? down here we were having a perfectly nice but, I mean, talk that, about there'll not... always be a lovely space for lovely documentaries yeah, Andy and tell him is... he's wrong tell him he's wrong well I no I, I, well we'll come to what's wrong but I, the, the truth is the quality of content in this mid form short form world is really poor yeah. and if you want to drive views you want to drive clickbait um, I think that's a very uh, you'll, and you'll do very well in the next year I think if you have an interest in what the world looks like in five years I place a bet on premium because it's just simply unsustainable for uh, f for this. So uh, eyeballs eye eyeballs are moving predominantly onto this device. That's been the ch a little dot we've we've seen in four years. 65, 70 percent of viewing when we started was on a desktop. 80 percent is now on that device. That's an explosion of viewing. The truth of the matter is because we analyse not just television content on YouTube, we analyse the population of viewing, and the truth is it's predominantly dross. Um, but that, that has to change, and it, the, the, it, that's about funding. So we have, in the UK, we have BBC Three who are funding short and mid-form uh, content. We have all four. Uh, there are pockets here and there, but outside of that, that there really isn't anything. Um, so you have funding to TV, which is huge industry, you have now this massive volume of eyeballs, mid and short form, and no funding for premium. So that, that has to change over the next four or five years. So I think you're right. Lots of views to dross, clickbait. But if, you, if you're interested in what the world looks like in five years' time, there has to be more premium in that. In that. that there just has to be. And that's the, that's the reason and, and, on, on real stories. It's I mean, all long form. is because we place that I care about five years' time, and, and I really believe... Quality will have to win out. And Netflix is spending what five billion? I think they've got an annual budget of five billion. Uh, I knew we'd get to Netflix eventually. They're going to save us all, all. Yeah, and that is all premium. You know, they're not. They're not. They're not producing crap. They're, they're, they're all. They're absolutely going for the top end of the market. Well, I mean, I, I think that throughout um, television and, and online too, there's a, 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 a split happening where the, the cheaper stuff is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and the more expensive stuff is getting more and more and more expensive, and the, the whole middle ground is actually becoming empty. Uh, and I can just say that, believe me, it's much better to be working in the expensive end than it is to be working <laughs> in the cheap end in many, many ways. Um, obviously, it's not as easy to get in because, you know, the problem with fewer, bigger, better is the fewer part. There are always going to be fewer uh, 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 very expensive programs than there are cheap programs, but you know the, 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 the quality end is becoming an amazing place to be. Okay. And that, I mean, that's what very much what happened at the BBC after the, after the licensee settlement was, you know, there was a very clear announcement to say, in, in factual, presumably, I guess, in the other genres as well, which was, <coughs> we're going to abandon the middle ground. You know, we want volume stuff that's cheap, that you can deliver, that we can commission 50 hours of, uh -huh. and then we want really good stuff, and we don't want this sort of middle ground stuff that's pretty good, but no one is never going to win an award and it's not going to get great audiences. Let's just go either way. Questions just come in for Jamie, I think. So, uh, does public service mean anything anymore in this online world? The answer is yes. Yes. Good. <laughs> I mean, I, I, mean I, would, I would say, you know, <laughs> Mum's Selling Their Kids for Sex was about Stacey Dooley going and, and to the Philippines with Homeland Security International, who were do you know, with a guy who had 
been infiltrating a paedophile ring for two years, and the reason Homeland Security gave us access to that story was because they want they felt there would there need to be more funding for this kind of operate this kind of undercover operation to, to penetrate paedophile rings, and they they were therefore up for, for doing that. That was absolutely a public service film. You know, it, it, it was really you know it was sen it had a sensational title, and there was you know it it was. It was clickbait in the sense that it was extreme to some extent, which is why it got so many views. But it was also very definitely a Absolutely. public service film. When, when we're commissioning all the time, we think we, we've got to, and it's, it's really it's um, at the sort of core of our being that we have to be sort of seeing it through that prism in terms of what is what, why are we sort of doing this. It's, it, it can't just be, be enough because it's a it's a good story or it will get watched. Well, let's have a look at a clip, Jamie. Can I just have? Um, <coughs> I said I wouldn't play this, but it might be quite interesting time to play it. It's the Reggie 8 Insider. So this went out um, earlier this year, and obviously well-known presenter. And it was a different way of sort of using access in, in a different way, and using Reggie in a sort of slightly repositioning Reggie in a, in a different way, um, and putting him in a much more sort of immersive role. But in terms of talking about that public service remit, I think it was really important in terms of why we were doing this, was to actually take a very sort of different look, and more sort of, um, from a different perspective at the American criminal justice system. Okay, so American prison system. Why is that public service for a UK audience? I think it was it was it was a chart. I think it's a, it's a it's a subject matter that's been done um, a lot on television. But I think uh, particularly at a time when the populace of the UK with the elections coming up, um, it felt like an important sort of timely piece to to look at a big subject matter for the for the for the British audience. I think it's. I think it is public service in the way that I think America is is massively relevant to how we live our lives here, um, and in, increasingly so whether we like it or not. And I think it's um, a subject matter that we know works for our audience. Yeah, that's and kind of my problem is that it's kind of posh <coughs> clickbait. We, you know, if the BBC isn't going to do stuff that it doesn't know works online, then Christ, what hope for any of us? I think that's actually true. I think there's a, there's a lot of stuff that we do that it's. Um, American content that feels that it's, 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 it gets into, into really sort of important subject matters, um, and there's, yes, there's, there's absolutely sort of story at the heart of that, um, and story is, is something that is, is massively important to us. I think it's kind of a lot of our stuff is about it needs to feel sort of timely and relevant for that audience, or they won't watch it. It doesn't resonate with their lives. Mm. I think there's a massive resonance with, with a lot of what's going on in America with our audience's lives, mm. um, and I also think that there's a kind of we tend to do a lot of stuff that has moral ambiguity in it as well. Um, and things like Life and Death Row has, has always attracted a big audience because the stories are, are, are sort of not neat. I mean, uh, the, the point, look, the question about what without public service is really important because once upon a time we had a bit of a monopoly or a duopoly or a quadropoly and basically, you know, the BBC could afford to put on challenging programmes. Now, if they don't like it in the first 30 seconds, they're gone. So how do you use the power of communication that exists within online to, 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 as, a, as a force of good rather than clickbait. Uh, the, the challenges are innumerable now. It's, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's not just the first 30 seconds now. There's, a lot of it is around, you know, a, the, the majority of video in the next couple of years will be consumed on Facebook. It's, you know, that's just becoming an absolute phenomenon when it comes to online video. It's, it's, it's outgunning and outperforming anything else. And does that change what the content needs to be? Yeah, because it's on that the, platform. Why? It's, it's the thing that's, that's most prevalent around it is that it's silent. So when you're strolling through it from your Facebook stream, uh, the, you'll, you'll see that there's been a resurgence in, in subtitling. And I remember when, you know, a few years ago, there's a lot of time when it's like, oh, you can't make content with subtitles. Kids don't read subtitles. Kids don't read. You can't make content with subtitles. And now you can't make content for kids without subtitles because they don't, they don't listen. They don't listen. And it's a little, so the, the challenges are completely new. And, and it was only very recently that we were being told a lot around that it's around the hero image and the title. And now it's not around that at all because people don't look at the text that's underneath the Facebook post. They literally just look at the first, I would argue, 30 frames of a bit of content. And if it, I hate this phrase, but somebody's coined the phrase thumb, thumb stopping. If it stops your thumb, then, then you're onto a winner. And, and that's, that's what kind of gets you there. That's what you've got to start thinking about now. But you also need to think about what comes after that. So, uh, will Facebook turn on sound? Is, is that going to be a thing? Are we going to see content being shown in a different way? And, and so you've got to kind of not only be aware of what's happening today, but also be aware of what's happening next. And the, I think the easiest way of doing that is looking at your own viewing habits and seeing how you stop and watch content and figuring out what works for you and what doesn't work for you, making that work, and then making sure you're always up to date on, on what the latest delivery platforms are. 
Yeah, I, I think there's um, so that there's a there's a there's a difference between clickbait, which is uh, you'll never guess what happened next, and a thumbnail of looks like some appalling Kim Kardashian. Yeah, uh, and understanding if you're a broadcaster that you are going from a world of limited bandwidth where there were once five channels and it feels hard now because there are 300 channels. But on these platforms, there are 400 hours being uploaded every minute if it's YouTube. So it's not clickbait to understand being seen on these platforms of unlimited bandwidth uh, is a skill. And so, so that's, that's, that's not that's not clickbait for me. That's operating in a different environment and, and learning that you. What is that curation? Uh, it's just it's just a completely different skill. And uh, the, 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 uh, listen, I'm not a scheduler, but I suspect you know when I, well, when I was at Channel Four, a great trailer that played out at the right time would reach <laughs> such a huge portion of the population. That was a great way to break the show. And then it was about what's the slot. And there's a heck of a lot of science behind that in itself. On these platforms, it really is the Wild West, and you're, you're fighting against, uh, for viewing against a vlogger, against overt clickbait. I mean, you're really fighting against many, many other content providers. That's I mean, a loose, loose definition. So, something I don't quite understand, to be honest, is the fact that, you know, you guys have told me that Chosen is incredibly popular on, on, on the channel, and yet, you know, Chosen is, is a two-hour film where three bloke, three, three middle-aged men talk direct to camera about being sexually abused at a public school, and, and there are some stills. And it's two hours long. Mm. And, and, and there's no, you know, there is no point of that film that you can grab and you can put on the, 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 the icon that will look any different to any other bit, because it's just three blokes talking straight to camera about being sexually abused. And, they, and no one even mentioned sexual abuse for the first 40 minutes of the film. And so I don't, I absolutely, am, I was astonished when I was told that it that, was really popular on the channel. I don't I, get it. I think that, that, that plays, this, I think, a second point, which is how you behave on different platforms. Well, you have to behave differently on different platforms because they, they display different characteristics. So Facebook is a place people go six times a day and they'll watch for 30 seconds, but they haven't got time. But it's multiple viewing of short clips. YouTube is now a place that people go once every two days on average, the average duration on a mobile is 44 minutes on a mobile. So we could see, and there's a lot of data behind it when you've got lots of viewing, but you start to see what the algorithm is doing. And ultimately, sadly, we're all getting a video scene is all about what YouTube or Facebook's kind of key objective at that time is. And so they will change the, the algorithm to fit their objective. Yeah. YouTube is now a place of watching longer videos. So a two hour documentary is gold for the YouTube algorithm because they want people watching for longer and they're going from the mobile phone, they now want to hit your living room. So we could see duration of viewing is critical and we can see key search terms and we can analyze what people are searching for. So okay, the biggest documentary of yours is Poor, Poor Kids has done 5.7 million views on real stories. Um, oh. And then that, that's... More, which is more than it did on BBC One. Just, yeah, just going to break in there, guys, because uh, I'm getting a lot of texts saying, can you get Andy to talk more about what he's looking for? There's free drinks afterwards paid for by Real Stories. <laughs> uh, so you can, you can ask Andy well, about can you get a drink if you have a Real, real Stories uh, later. Hamish wants to show a clip which he which well, speaks to this point, I think. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, one of the things that's really interesting from the point of view of a big network choosing whether to release a big documentary either on TV or online is a lot of it is not just about finding a, a, a new audience, but it's about, in a way, owning the debate and owning the right. argument and the discussion that goes on around that. Right. And I think that there are some programmes that particularly lend themselves to that. So, for example, the one that I was going to show is, uh, is LA92. I know it's made by Simon Chin, a man that you barred from being mentioned earlier in the introduction. But you're out there, uh, Simon. Um, it wasn't me. <laughs> it, it's uh, a programme about the Los Angeles riots, and it's, you know, particularly for an American audience, incredibly pertinent in this era of Black Lives Matter matter and of you know urban unrest and so on and actually in some ways quite an inflammatory film potentially so by releasing that film online and then curating discussion all around it and t turning that into a forum where people could really post and join the discussion right. you basically are doing a completely different thing from what you're ever able to do 
with a show like that. Okay, and I think that's that's what I was sort of trying to get to, is that's public service. In 2017, the, the curation of important debate is what public service should be about, I think. Well, it's as only, much as content creation. It's only much more possible online to curate something like, something like that. And but and once but you, do you actually really care? I mean, you, you, I know you, you've got this thing on, but, but really Fox own you and you're all about bucks. So it's about <laughs> provoke a great big discussion, drive a great big audience, and then fuck off and leave them. Well, no, of, I, mean, I mean, it's, it's commercial, but, but it's, in, in, a, in a way, the, the, um, what the channel considers with, with, a, with a topic like this is, you know, you could just avoid making, the, if you really just yeah. felt it was all about bucks, just avoid making the controversial stuff. But in a way, much, much more legitimate is to make the controversial program and then not run away from the argument once the argument is there, but provide a place where that can be can be done. Can I show you the clip before you ask me yeah. another horrible question? No, I wasn't going to. <laughs> I'm going to ask the panel whether they actually get involved in that curated discussion on a long-term basis or think they should after we've looked at Hamish's provocative clip. So I think the point about that was there was real concern that showing how one incident, in this case the beating of Rodney King, escalated over a 24-hour period into a huge race riot across an entire city that, you know, you're actually in some ways potentially inciting that to happen. So, you know, by, by dealing with it, by having a, a you know, a, a, a big conversation online, maybe you can stop that from happening or maybe the opposite might happen. But, I mean, it was trending number four on Twitter in the U.S., which is quite hard to achieve. So, clearly, you know, the, the people, people wanted to discuss. Okay. BBC, curation versus creation. Do you do very much curation, or don't you see that as part of your job as a documentary well, you maker? To find what you mean by sort of well, exactly what Hamish is talking about. You create an event, you create a community who are talking about it. You know, we're just talking about the internet as if it were a community, as if it were a distribution mechanism. It's not. It's a two-way thing. That's its strength. Yeah. I think yes, absolutely, we do. I think the, um, the film mentioned before that we're, we're, we're playing at the festival um, down this weekend in America. I think it's um, we decided to. To make a big sort of statement film, it could have been a it could have been a 40, 50, 60 minute film, but it's a much longer film. There's assets around that to make much more of it. I think part of that is to create debate to make a bigger splash. Those assets can get shared by other people that might not come to the to the long form film. I think absolutely, like any, whether it's I think it's kind of whether it's kind of on on linear or sort of online. I think there's there's <coughs> absolutely that if you're if you're not making content that is that is that is being debated, um, then it's kind of slightly pointless in a way, really. So I think there's absolutely anything that we can do to sort of curate that and to drive that. I think <coughs> we should be doing that. Okay. We were talking about this before. To talk a little bit about what you... Were. Well, I mean, just to add another C into the pot, is um, I, I think w w the way that we look at it is that we are a consultant as well. And, and I think actually a lot of this discussion is is quite convoluted because there are now no, so many platforms and there is a type of content that you make for Facebook, there's a type of content that you make for Netflix, there's a type of content you make for Amazon and if you try and move them between each other it gets very muddied very quickly and I think that the way that we operate as a business and I think that what all production companies will start doing moving forward is that in the same way that you go to a briefing about specialist factual or about factual entertainment, you'll start going to panels and, and start pitching people around what BBC3 online is or what Nat Geo is, which is a very mm. different product, even though they're both delivered on your iPhone through your, your device. And, and I think that once you start thinking about the medium, not just the medium in which they're going to be consumed and the, the format in which they are, but, but also start thinking about what that platform is trying to say, you start unlocking things. There's a, there's a big misconception around Netflix and Amazon Prime Video being the same thing. They're absolutely not. They're con two completely different business models doing two completely different bits of content. But because the people are trying to push them into competition with each other, you assume that the same sort of content is going to appear on both. A documentary on Netflix is very, very different to what a documentary on Amazon is going to look like. And that's just two of the big hero examples. And once you start drilling down to that platform by platform, I think our jobs as production companies is to be consultants and say, we understand your platform, we watch your channel, we think that this access and this content will be amazing on, on that. And, and that's, that's the trick and the, that we have to pull, I think, as production companies. Okay, we're running quite short of time. Uh, a question just coming in, in what way are Netflix and Amazon different? I find that quite interesting. Well, I was, no, there's a, this was said at, um, at the Recode event this week, and, and they, they said quite clearly that they see, net, no, sorry, Amazon is, is like, they call it Walmart, but it's like Tesco's. You know, you go there, you buy your shoes, you buy your t-shirts, you also watch some video, you also get your nappies, and it's, it's a 
hodgepodge of lots of different things, whereas Netflix is video streaming. It doesn't do anything else. They're talking about doing films. Somebody said, well, you're going to start a, a movie theatre. They're like, no, you've got a movie theatre in your home. That's what your movie theatre is. Well, are you going to start putting adverts in front of your content? No, because that's not what a business model is. They, they have pioneered binge viewing. They do that very, very well. Making a murderer only really works on Netflix. And I don't think that necessarily works on Amazon, because I think the viewing habits of what Amazon is isn't the same. And, and Grand Tour works for them, because you can have very big, bill, big flashy billboards in the same way that you can sell a product. But Netflix doesn't work, in, I don't think, works in the same way. It's subtly different, obviously, um, and it's closer to the difference in channels. But, but I use that example because I think people should be looking at different online platforms in the same way to look at different channels. Does that make sense? It does, and um, it's really important that you know the length of your slot. We've actually still got 18 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking hate this linear stuff, you know, I just can't do it. It's all about scheduling. Cut it to what it makes. <laughs> okay, so what, is, what frustrates you, Jamie, if anything, in kind of... Are there any constraints that the linear model that you're looking forward to being able to be in with online? Um, I think it's, it's a... We're definitely, on a, we're definitely on a cliche, but we definitely feel that we're on a journey. I think there's some things that we've tried that we really thought were going to work and haven't worked. That's been um, that's been surprising horses that we back that we thought were really, really brilliant pieces of television EJ. Um, series. Example being American High School, and I think that it's it's probably the thing that I'm sort of most proud of from the last sort of 12 months, and it didn't work. And just quite interesting, can we just play the, um, the pre title for American High School and have a look? That was made by uh, Swan Films and they did a brilliant job of it. It's a six part series for BBC Three and it was commissioned a year out from the American election and landed, we thought, cleverly just in time for the, um, the, the, the Trump election. And so we thought it had a sort of timeliness and a relevance to it. And the production values were brilliantly executed, it had great character, great narrative. But it didn't cut through, and I think there, there are looking at it now and working out what why it didn't cut through. And I think we there was a sort of assumption that um, that, that those kind of classic staples of documentaries in terms of sort of character, and narrative, and and quality of um, production values will will always win out. And I don't think that's the case. I think there was a when you are on um, slightly beholden to to iPlayer for your long form pieces, mm -hmm. iPlayer is um, is not a destination in its own right. It's a, it's a catch up service. I think. Um, you sometimes can struggle to, to find an audience. I think there was a jadedness around, there was a lot of American content because of the news, I think. We thought that would bring an audience, I think it did. Um, and I also think in terms of when people, I think it's that sort of clickbaity thing, sadly, in a way at the moment, that when people saw it on iPlayer. It is a piece you're really proud of. Yeah. And it's still up there. And presumably <coughs> people are going to view it in their tens of thousands, umpteen millions possibly over the next year. So why is it a failure? I think it's a failure because I think that we wanted. Obviously, you want you want to get a sort of you want to get a bigger audience to it, and you want to create you want to create a debate around it, and you want to get. Right. I think that there is a, it's, we're not sort of driven by by overnight, but you also want to get stuff noticed and get stuff talked about. Do you think that would have worked on the old linear BBC Three? <laughs> that show. Um, I do think it would have worked. Yeah, I do think it would have worked. So there's a significant difference between programmes you can roll out on BBC Three online from BBC Three linear. I think so, yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, it was, I think people, a lot of people didn't know what it was. Yeah. And I think in the online world, people, you need to, when you're faced with that sort of, that, the, the choices that you have out there, people get, people are quite scared. And I think people, even a sort of young audience, there's an expectation that they're adventurous. But I think people didn't know what it was. I think some people saw it as a, was it an acquisition? This sounds a bit like well, High School Musical. I think people yeah. sometimes are risk averse, and I think that didn't help it at all. I think had we called it the most segregated high school in America, it was it was a school in in South Carolina that was not. But a bit interesting, black. you know, in the middle of that, you said that the old-fashioned craft values you don't think are going to drive an audience. Andy, that's not what you're finding. <clears throat> you need them, but I don't think it's the, you can't rely on them alone. I think you need other things as well in your favour. Yeah, we uh, so Real Stories is predominantly working with archive, so we're just representing and repackaging TV. <clears throat> Different part of our business is very much producing for short and mid form and and that is without question a, diff a completely different skill set so it depends whether i don't know enough about the bbc and bbc3 strategy but whether i would imagine the iplayer viewer is much more from the world of tv mm. whereas if you're distributing it first on other platforms 
it, it's, it just needs to be much, uh, lots of things, but much pacier. So it could be that a court in, you know, is it a TV show or is it something you okay. want to I mean, do? It's nice because we spent a long time in episode one making sure that we set up the, yeah. sort of, the sort of precinct of the campus and making sure everyone knew where they were and actually, and even starting, should we start with a pre-type like that? It looks brilliant. A lot of people in the room probably think it's really good. A lot of people in the industry were like, this is a really good quality piece of work. But maybe drop the pre-title and start straight away Huge on the story. Yeah. We often it's say kind of, that's what you need. It's a massive challenge, I think, because when you're... example I quite often use is... I watch The Apprentice. It's the end of the day. I've been working, got the kids to bed. I sit down and I'm ready. And the first two or three, four minutes of The Apprentice are those amazing shots of London, the skyline of London. And I'm really happy to view that. And I just... I'm starting to relax. Online, we just have to hit them in the first three seconds because yeah. there's an email coming in, I've got Facebook to go to, I've got YouTube. It's just a very is different that, form of viewing, I think. Is that the case with Brian's films that are cutting through, though? So I think we're, with Real Stories, I think we're, we're on, it's solely focused on YouTube at the moment. YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world. People are searching for factual information. We can analyse search terms so we can serve up these full-length documentaries because we can see an audience wants it. I think that's quite different to a, you say, a six-part series. I think that's just much more challenging. Um, I don't have an answer, but I can see... I mean, it looked amazing, but uh, you, you could feel like I'm more in that environment where I'm in my living room and I'm ready to sit down and just enjoy yeah. something that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Whereas on these platforms, that's not necessarily the well, mindset. Lean back and lean forward. Right in the middle of what you were saying, you sounded kind of slightly dismissive of the iPlayer. Do you think the iPlayer, the BBC missed, missed the boat with the iPlayer and, and as a BBC programme maker commissioner, now you're just looking at Facebook or any other? Not at all. I think you just have to, to utilise all the platforms, absolutely. I think that's absolutely, iPlayer is, is absolutely key to, to BBC3. I think, as I said before, it's kind of, it's not a, it's not a destination of its own rights, but it's a, it's a sort of catch-up service and a lot of people sort of use it as that. I think if you get into that sort of top ten, it becomes a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're outside of that, I think it's harder to sort of cut through. Okay. Can I? Can Sorry. I think it's, it's no, just, please. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask questions. Is that, is that please do. Like, so, you, you mentioned about how it's called American High School, and that might not be the right title. Why don't you just pull a Kanye and change the title? We did. We changed it to what well, we added a subtitle called Straight Out Orangeburg. But if you're saying that the most segregated <clears> school <throat> in America may have worked yeah. better, it's sitting there on iPlayer, and it's you know it's it yeah. you know it's still there. Why don't you just change the title and, and see if it performs better? I mean, if you look at how, how websites work and how, how you know, there are the, the biggest websites in the, in the world have, you know, the ABC <coughs> that, that, that Google do, it's just change the title and see if it yeah. performs better. I mean, it's, is it like, is that something that you might see doing in the future? And so, it's yeah, like, you as you person, as, because you now got to log in to do iPlayer, and it's like if you change the title, so it, totally. it fits you. But whose job is it in the organisations to do that? That's my point about curation, that the way the BBC is still set up as a series of linear channels, even I think with BBC Three, it's like, well, that's gone now, I'm on to the next thing, rather than... No, but I would be quite excited to deliver something to you guys which had three different titles. And if somebody logs into iPlayer and they watch a lot of comedy programmes, I may have a kind of more comedic title. If somebody watches a lot of dramas, I may have a more dramatic title. You know, this was done around House, House of Cards, wasn't it, where they released different trailers depending on what it is you watch most often <clears throat> on Netflix and, and you guys I'm guessing have the power and technology to do that with iPlayer or is it just not set up to do it that way? I think we do, I think it's, it's evolving all the time, I think your, I think your suggestion is good, I think we need to be more fleet of foot and more flexible and be led by the audience more. I think that's, that's it, that, that's really what's good. exciting about really communication is, is be, the audience becomes be the executive way, producer way and says yeah, yeah. why not try it like this, if you read the comments and actually yeah. Yeah. respond to them they also reward you by saying, Christ, these people are listening to us. Commenting on iPlayer, that sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was, that was very uh, instructive and, and honest, saying that that one didn't work. Tell us about a mistake that you've learned from in the online space. Well, well I mean, I, I suppose that for, from the point of view of a, um, of a network putting some of, the, of, ex, of our expensively funded content online, the thing you worry about most is people watching it, liking it, and having absolutely no idea that it's got anything to do with you. Right. And that's exceedingly easy to do in this space, where you, you'll find that people uh, um, will be talking about a particular clip or talking about a moment for a programme. They have no clue that it's National Geographic. And it's actually, once it's out there, very hard to prevent that from happening. That was always the case. You know, Panorama on Princess Diana, the research showed that most people thought it was an ITV programme. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's difficult for you know even if people are watching actually watching on your channel, they sometimes aren't aware that they're, they're, they're doing that. But I just mean, get all your presenters to wear this. Exactly, uh, that's right. There's, <laughs> there's, 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 there's some, there's, <laughs> and you know, on the subject of the handy little pin, 
uh, you will notice that that, that the, the bug, as they call it in the in the in the US, is exceedingly prevalent now on all the stuff that we put out there. And you know, as long as you can keep that little rectangle up there, uh, you've got a chance. And I, so, in some ways, why having quite a distinctive logo is is important. But uh, I mean, I think that that is going to be increasingly a problem that because people don't really. Uh, look for linear channels, even if they do find a thing branded uh, um, uh, as belonging to a linear channel, it doesn't really have very much meaning. No. And I think that, you know, from the point of view of National Geographic, that building a sense of the brand being a thing is vitally important in, in terms of the way that you, you're working. You have a community of fans. I mean, I, I uh, yeah. never understand why you didn't exploit that. Well, I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're, the, we're actually the number one non-celebrity brand on Facebook, which is quite an amazing thing to be, but again, you probably tell me that that's, you know, a robot generated that, but I mean, it is really largely because of, um, it is really largely because of the fact that people, you know, uh, um, think of National Geographic as being a photographic medium to a very large extent, so very big on Snapchat, very big on Instagram, um, and, you know, a lot of people find the online content not through the channel, but through the other parts of National Geographic, and then find the, 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 the TV content through that. So it's, again, something that most other um, comparable TV channels don't have the luxury of, because they don't kind of have a magazine, or explorers, or all these other sort of bits of what the brand is that can feed back into how people experience the thing online. Mm. So can you talk about how Nat Geo is, is you know, the, the brand in the bug in the corner? And do you ever see a situation where you might put True Vision's brand in the top left-hand corner or Lemonade Money's logo in the top left-hand corner? Because I think that for us, what, what you're saying is it becomes true for us. It's terms of trade and international, you know, we, we lose those terms of trade because we're selling things internationally and we have to sign away those rights. Actually, our brand becomes very important as well. And, and do you think that there'll ever be a world where you've got BBC3 on one side and you've got the production company on the other side? Well, I mean, the, the, at present things turn up in all sorts of different forms in all sorts of different places. And I mean, most of those things come down to, to deals and transactions. Yeah. But um, certainly, I mean, fundamentally for us, it's about that National Geographic brand being, being visible. Um, so, uh, no. <laughs> maybe. I guess the answer is maybe. Yeah, I wrote down data because you, you, you spoke about data in your very first answer. I mean, presumably you haven't learned anything because you already knew it, or have you learned stuff? <laughs> Learned what in the last hour and a half here? No, no, <laughs> you won't have learned anything in the last hour and a half. <laughs> I mean, in your adventures online, because you have all this data coming back, and there was a time when data was the new oil, wasn't it? All that bollocks being talked. Is it actually useful, or do you just get like <laughs> submerged? Uh, no, data is really useful for us. So we um, just we have so much viewing, and we, we then. I'm not going to get too geeky, but we have a separate team. We have five guys who are data analysts who then analyze the data for us, and it's useful for a range of reasons, either, um, going geeky for a minute, either they're saying there's been an algorithm change, so uh, could be anything, we thought five minutes 41 was the optimum length, and we now think it's six minutes 50, it could be it's anything as simple as that, because the algorithm changes regularly and you've got to be on top of it, and that's all about how do you, it's all about getting on the first page of search. If you get on the first page of search, you get views, and that's an algorithm. Mm -hmm. So the data helps with, 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 the, um, with algorithms, uh, the data helps us just look at subject matters. So a big client of ours is Formula E. We produce a lot of content for Formula E, which is motor racing. So we would use the data to look at, do we see anything bubbling up around motorsport? So we saw a lot happening with onboards. We kind of could see a big surge in viewing of onboards in motorsport. So it means from a production point of view, we're able to pivot and make, make more onboards for Formula E. So there are editorial decisions we can make. Uh, and finally, it helps us with talent. So... Uh, we do brand, like Lemonade Money, we do a lot of branded work. So we did a big video for Porsche, and we can analyse the data. And there's a YouTube page called Allié that fitted with exactly what they wanted for, for, for that. So da data, I mean, you've got to make sure you don't become slave to the data because you want to have that freedom and uh, creative spirit within a company. But the data for us is, um, is really valuable. OK. Final points, anyone? Before we uh, we thank our two producers, Emma and Alex, who are standing there, feels like it's been a bit of a trip around the bay, very, very disparate, but all very interesting <laughs> points. And they're all going to be available in the bar for free drinks, paid for by... Real Stories. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to thank the panel very much. <laughs>